So Hillary has decided that the the best place to bitch about Bernie three years after she lost an election is on uh, Trump's best friends radio show, right? Amazing. <laughs> Howard Stern. And she's uh, deriding the fact that Bernie had the audacity to uh, offer his potential voters something in exchange for their vote, which was affordable college. And they're equating it, and her and Howard are just laughing it up and yucking it up about, you know, like, oh, they're just offering free chocolate milk. <laughs> that's quid pro quo. That's that's corruption. That's <laughs> the, the worst corruption is democracy, and that's why we're slowly moving away from it in this great nation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Howard Stern thing is such an amazing choice, too. Like, that's how you know she's fucking bitter beyond belief. She's like, who can, where can I go now? I think, well, I mean, you've done most of the main shows already. I'm sure Maddow would love to have you. And like, no, I need someone angrier, someone shittier. Like, oh, yeah, there you go. Howard Stern. You must have loved that. But that's also like uh, one of like an apotheosis of like the boomer brain, you know, like maybe deep down Hillary is like, we've got to be edgy guys. We've really got to appeal to that <laughs> 19 to the 20. Apotheos- the, the, ni- the apotheosis of the boomer brain. I'm sorry. No, like- I'm just imagining Dr. Manhattan like the H2 is actually the perfect vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's like it's like Hillary is trying to like she's she's trying to reinvent herself as this edgy, like, you know, post post 2016 centrist suck dim or whatever and she's like well, who is the edgiest guy oh let's go on howard stern the guy who was last I, relevant you know 25 years ago or something like that like yeah that'll get him that'll show him i love that for her i need to appeal to the youth who, what's the uh the most with it person i know howard stern <laughs> kids love him right well no she's appealing to <laughs> the yes, base grandma. which is boomers like again it, he. No kids listen to Howard Stern. No one's like, you know who I want to hear right now? Howard Stern. That that's <laughs> not it. Right? That that's guys that, you know, they were commuting in their their truck twenty years ago and they're like, This Bob and Tom's kind of boring. What if I could hear about tits at eight in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. If Hillary wanted to get to the youth, she could just ask her husband. Uh, mm. Mm. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> I was going to continue that riff, and then I, I felt a, a hand on my sh- my shoulder. I turned around, and it was Jesus. And he said, "Rest easy, soldier. Your tour is done." <laughs> This is Brad. Everyone looks forward. This is Rob at Dumb and Awful. This is Brad at Fizz for Shizzle, and I am fucking done with PA school, motherfuckers. Boop, boop. PA means what? Physician assistant. Not quite a doctor. A little higher than a nurse. We all work together. American healthcare. My favorite Britney Spears lyric. Yeah. <laughs> in, in case, uh, I'm sorry, because I know, right, I don't want to leave the listener in suspense, uh, especially because these are kind of important topics. Uh, I just want to confirm, twice did win in an upset over Blackpink, uh, best female group, oh, a- yeah. and uh, best uh, female choreo. I don't know what that means, but they won best female choreo for Fancy uh, as it's well, great, which, uh, which I called day one. So That's uh, going to be their dancing, it. I imagine. <laughs> I'm just saying, those girls work so hard. <laughs> can we get them on? Are they coming on? Does anyone, Do any of us speak Korean? They can speak English, okay? They're professionals. <laughs> so uh, don't, like, this is not going to make the show. It's fine. But uh, yesterday during, like, fucking ever. Hey, speak with confidence, <laughs> okay? You don't know what will and won't make the show. We'll put some real trash on the actual <laughs> episode. You have no idea what mood I'll be in when I edit this. I uh, <laughs> Two of the girls in my program were, like, fucking dancing down the floor, and they were doing, like, shitty ballet moves. And it turns out, actually, my sister was a professional ballet dancer, and I grew up, like, watching The Nutcracker 15 times a year. Like, I can... Oh, dude, I'm I'm with you. I, I have six years of ballet training. Are you for real, real? 
Yeah, for real. Uh, me too, actually. Well, not six years, but a few. Anyway, so I looked at them, and I was in a pissy mood because I hate my life. And I was like, your turnout is awful, Lauren. Anyway, Get their ass. Yeah. Mean girl, Get them. it up. Yeah, I fucked them up. And I showed them my turnout, which is incredible because I have my like Slavic, you know, Polish hip jeans. We have natural agility from dodging feral boars. <laughs> <laughs> That's why all the best and ballets Russian are. Spears. Look, they're packed with Slavs. We know what we're doing. And <laughs> Ballet is, is just Slavic capoeira because it developed. <laughs> it was originally a martial art where you had to like avoid the uh, the dark forest creatures and, and it just became dance. I guess it's the opposite of capoeira, but I'm not going to let that stop me. <laughs> My sister one time, she had a, uh, she was at these huge auditions and like, you know, fucking wherever they were. And uh, she had a, I'll never forget listening to the dance instructor. And these girls were like 10. I mean, they were like 11. It's, it's it, you know, it's insanity. And the fucking choreographer comes out and says, I am an artist and I do not paint with fat brushes. And like, there you like, you just saw eating disorders like appear throughout the room. Like that girl's going to start purging later tonight. That's really obnoxious. Because at that age, the girls should already know that's how ballet works. <laughs> he shouldn't have had to say that. <laughs> I'm sad he was in that position. <laughs> People like clean lines. <laughs> oh, Jesus. But I was, since you were talking about school stuff earlier, I've been... So I'm trying to do the going back to school master's thing, have the DOD pay for it, right, with my GI Bill. Um, I still have enough GI Bill left because they give you X number of months, 36 months, I think, Um and they prorate it so it's like, if you were in class for literally three weeks uh, of September, it's just the three weeks comes out of the 36 months, right? So it's like, nice. 36 months is really like four or five years if you don't do summers. Um, so it's a decent amount of time. And uh, <clears throat> so you have to go through this whole fucking process, though, every time. And every school does a little differently. They have to like certify that you're actually in the classes that you say that it's full time or part time because you get different uh, benefit rates depending on that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, how much is tuition, private school, public school, right? It has to get all of this information and send it to the VA. And then the VA takes his dear sweet time to process. But the first part of that is you have to go onto your the site called eBenefits where you're supposed to manage all of your VA benefits. And, and get your thing that says like, yes, I am actually entitled to uh, this this particular benefit. Here's how much it says I have left so that you can check and know that I'm not full of shit, right? Um, that website, like all VA websites, uh, doesn't run 24-7, 365. It doesn't make any sense at all. Right? Yeah, no, I know. I, I was realizing this the other day because I was talking to a friend of mine and they were like, wait, what? You have to wait for the website to be online? I was like, yeah, it's the, the VA website. They have banker's hours. They'll, they have... Some of them are better now, but most of the websites, or at least many of them that I used to use, were like nine to five or nine to four. That's, I don't know why you're complaining. This is the future that socialists want. You know, you, you think once Pornhub is unionized, it's going to be there for you twenty four seven. Hell no. <laughs> once once that motherfucker is a teamster, you're going to see it out back smoking a cigarette. Like, buddy, you can wank or not wank. It's not my problem for another thirteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's so they run on their own hours and then even within those hours they'll just the website will just get taken down or be locked out and they'll just be like oh it's under maintenance and you're like it's monday at noon what what the fuck is it what are you guys doing maintenance for right now uh and then you know three hours later you check back and it's got some different error message so basically anytime you want to use a va website you go okay this is what i'm doing uh every day for the next four days every two to four hours i'm checking this website and seeing if it's up and then you just keep going until, until magically you get in. Uh, this the last time it took me four days, which wasn't bad. Time before that took me like two weeks. This is for the... Uh, E-benefit stuff, yeah, for to get my GI Bill stuff. Oh, for the new school. Yeah, the new school doesn't make it doesn't make it easy. They have a lot they of stuff. They all do this, though. No, but yeah, yeah, but, but like I mean, they anytime you apply for college, like there's a lot of prereqs you have to hop through. But you're really getting it on both ends because you're dealing with the VA for the records and then the new school, which like they ask for a lot. I mean, you can't even matriculate there until you're on HRT. <laughs> <laughs> you should go to school in the South where if, um, like for example, there were several PA schools that I applied to back in the day. I, I did. It, it wasn't that great. Yeah, that was awful. We both did. <laughs> uh, where um, if you were former military, you got an interview no matter what your grades were, right? So you could come in and like 
barely have any of the prereqs and they'll be like, Oh, you were military. You're in. And I am sure that if you're using your military, you know, your, your e benefits to pay for school, like at Kennesaw state university or something like that, that they have that very streamlined and very quick, not just because they support the troops, but because they want that sweet, sweet government money. <laughs> and they've got that well, shit down to a science. Same, you would think the same would be true at the new school. I and mean, Brett, we're joking about this where like, they actually have a veteran coordinator, but like, since, that has never happened. It's just like a coat hanger with like a, a, a poncho and like a hat that they're like, oh, fuck, an actual veteran. Like right now they're just on red alert. <laughs> I emailed a bunch of questions, still no response. And I was like, yeah, uh, actually every school, even the ones that have like really good programs, they're never quick to respond. <laughs> it's just when you finally get a call, it's going to be like, Hello, my name is Debonair, and I served in the Marines. It's just someone from the acting school <laughs> just doing their best. I think no matter what happens uh, with you going back to school, you'll probably at the very least be employed as the veteran coordinator at the new school. Oh, it's such an easy job to get, dude. Like, uh, it's every single person I know who's gotten that job has been like, it's incredibly easy, uh, which is why almost everyone that you've ever met is incompetent because they realize very quickly that you don't even have to do work. You just collect the paycheck. You know, David Graeber talks about bullshit jobs, but it's, it's, there's, and there's a lot of them in our economy, but it's hard to think of one more bullshit than veteran coordinator at the new school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm the only veteran. I'm going to coordinate myself. Yeah. Lots of veterans <laughs> really coordinate some alcohol into my mouth. <laughs> a lot of veterans are really interested in like this Derrida esque breakdown of, you know, a, just David Sedaris's like, phone book. Yeah. The, the the intramural poetry coach is just like that guy does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great school. God bless yeah. him. So there's a uh, unrelated. There's a uh, video game that people are talking about today. A Jesus Christ video game. I'm just gonna read you the key features of this Jesus Christ video game. Open world, special skills, nude mod, <laughs> realistic fight with Satan. I'm tired of these fucking, <laughs> fucking casuals coming in here with their one button combos, beating Satan and thinking they've accomplished something. Man, unlike Diablo, that fake shit, we have modeled Satan the way it works in real life. Nine inches, six inch circumference. <laughs> uh, over 30 miracles, like healing people, walking on water, calming storm. Feeding people, that miracle of feeding people. That miracle list, uh, that they, they really, <laughs> like, what's the word? Like, by miracle, when you, if you're the developer, it's like, all right, this is going to be going on the back of the box, so we need to have a lot of miracles. If we say seven miracles, that's not going to be enough. By miracle 22, you're just like a able to talk about the Philistines without offending anybody. <laughs> Other key feature after the miracles, baptizing, getting superpower of Holy Spirit. <laughs> Praying and increasing of Holy Spirit, and then crucifixion and resurrection. And resurrection is misspelled on their official. <laughs> <laughs> two R's, you motherfuckers! God damn it! Yeah, that that sucks. But here's the thing: you want to make sure that feature is listed because the crucifixion mini game is a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, speaking of the crucifixion part, that so it's the end of Act Two. Obviously, it's like structurally, you know. But during they, they have a clip of that, and you're sitting there, first person on the cross, looking at, and you can like scroll back and look at both, you know, thieves on either side of you, as your like health bar like deteriorates and goes away, while you're just sitting there dying as Jesus, which I mean that's what I'm here for, you know what I mean? Well, there's there's also a lot of quick time events which I I don't normally like, where it's just like. Press X to not yell, fuck, holy <laughs> shit, fuck, why, God, why? <laughs> and that can be challenging, but, you know, we have Shenmue to thank for that one. <laughs> you have to plug in a separate controller like Metal Gear Solid during the crucifixion scene? Uh, that wasn't, there wasn't a crucifixion <laughs> scene. That was when you were fighting, like, Psycho Mantis, or what was the name? Yeah, was Psycho Yeah, Psycho Man. Yeah, it, but they just do the same loop, but on the crucifixion. So, like, if you have it on PC, it's like, mm. <laughs> Jesus is just like, oh, I'm dying on the cross for everyone's sins. For your sins, Brett, one of them includes going to Pornhub.com <laughs> 42 times. 
How did he know? <laughs> the game is uh, very clearly, very clearly uh, uh, an Elder Scrolls skin. Like it, it just looks exactly like it. Yeah, it, it has it has the two hands just like constantly out in grope position. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I, I, I might actually play it. Fuck oh, it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm into that. I will come up. I'm into that shit. Remember when, of course you don't, but so Ewan McGregor did a Jesus film called like 40 Days in the Desert and it released in like New York and LA and 10 people saw it. I assume nine in LA and then just me in New York because I was literally <laughs> the only one in the theater. And it's fascinating. I love this Jesus versus devil stuff. It was a decent enough movie. My favorite part of that is for like 10 minutes, a major plot point is like, is Jesus getting horny right now? <laughs> he stays with this nomad family and he keeps like giving looks to the, uh, to the mother. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus is about to fuck this desert nomads mom. That's one of the mini games. It's keep your nut. That, <laughs> keeping your nut is actually, a, that's the 24th miracle on the list. <laughs> Mary Magdalene comes in looking fucking bomb as hell. And you don't I, just, you don't jump her. <laughs> at a certain point you're walking through judea and like the camera in first person cuts up into the left and it's just like a, a statue with a bare thigh and it's like pound x to not get off <laughs> you've been holding your nut for 31 years <laughs> the worst part about this is the gameplay loop looks terrible like elder scrolls uh the old elder scrolls games aren't like particularly engaging from an action perspective right like you you do it because you're a nerd and you like reading dumb fantasy shit about kajit stealing stuff like not because the the way <clears throat> magic works looks particularly cool or interesting it's the same thing with this like you highlight a thing you press a button the grope hands light up yeah i'm glad you said elder scrolls because until then my like frame of reference it really does look like two i thought it was vr because it just looks like two disembodied hands like they ripped the engine from some japanese game where you just like squeeze breasts and sounds come out <laughs> <laughs> by the way i posted a picture uh of the realistic jesus fight or a uh, fight against satan fucking realistic my ass that looks worse than the first diablo I, it, yeah that, that's, that's a, diablo that shit doesn't look anything like George W. Bush. Hey, <laughs> hey! It's topical. Mike, Mike Myers. I was, gonna, yeah, Michael Myers. No, is that the Halloween guy or the guy that did the Flint duck? Either. Way? Oh no, that's uh, Michael that's Moore. Michael Moore. You're you're Michael confusing Moore. Michael Moore. That would be. Do I would see Halloween if it was Michael Moore with the mask <laughs> on, and he's like, I chased them through the house, but at the end of the day. It wasn't enough slow pan to them trying to get a drink. <laughs> so I just added another picture. I guarantee that for whatever reason, this is John the Baptist that you're saving. I, 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 I don't know why. I don't know why I feel that. But I think in this video game, when you fight Diablo Satan, that you're going to be saving him from uh, saving John the Baptist for no real reason. That's such bullshit. I, this is such a weird idiosyncrasy, uh, not like all the other ones. But John the Baptist got the, the shortest end of the stick in the Bible. This guy goes out there. He's evangelizing. He builds a following. He's wearing, uh, like, coarse animal skins as an allusion to Elijah. He's inventing baptism, basically. He's got a great backstory. In case you don't know the story of uh, John the Baptist, his dad is, uh, uh, like, a high priest, you know, w within wherever it is that happens yeah, some right Pharisees or he's some got a shit, wife yeah. yeah and his wife is is very old and he's never been able to produce an heir and everyone makes fun of him and he's just like this guy can't get it done in the bedroom if you know what i mean hmm. it's our, our spirits is the only thing he's getting up if, if you know <laughs> <laughs> this guy can't fuck and he's an object of ridicule and then one day he is the priest dedicated to go into like the most holy place of the tabernacle and so he goes off this is his big moment everyone's like you do it, buddy. You do it. And he comes home, and in an intervening time, somehow his old wife has gotten pregnant, right? And he stops talking. From the moment she got pregnant to the moment she gives birth, he doesn't say a fucking word, which very suspect about this miraculous conception, <laughs> right? Uh, like, just, I, I think we can read between the lines there, right? Uh, John the Baptist is born, and... Uh, the father still doesn't like him at all. And at like age eight, just kicks him out of the city. <laughs> so again, a miracle or uh, unlike with the Mary and Joseph thing, uh, not a very plausible miracle. So 
he has his immaculate conception. He's been kicked to the desert. He spends his whole life wandering, not just 40 days. He studies the Bible. He builds a following. He, he does everything right. And then just a hotter version of him shows up with a nice beard. And he just has to eat shit while Jesus puts his hand on him. It's just like, thank you so much for setting the table for me. Anyway, you can fuck off. And then he gets his head chopped yeah, off. Because totally not fair. John the Baptist was the Trotsky of his day. <laughs> <laughs> and he got his head chopped <laughs> off because he had the, you know, he fell in love with some chick who fucking betrayed him. Like, you know. Look, I get it. In terms of narrative, like the angel Gabriel came to me and said that uh, though I am a virgin, I will carry God's son is a way better narrative than I'm old as fuck. My womb is barren. Uh, my husband went away to the tabernacle for one second and now I'm pregnant and he won't speak to me. <laughs> and then he kicked my son out at like age eight into the desert. I get it. I'm just saying it's rough if you're John the Baptist. I was just going to say the, the Jesus game would be better if they had just based it instead of on Morrowind or one of those fucking games on that old like Jedi Outcast game. Give me some of the cool powers. Clo I mean, that would be pretty cool. To me, the best Jesus game is the one I played on Newgrounds.com in like 2004, where it's like a dating sim and you had to remember uh, <laughs> Jesus's birthday and favorite food. <laughs> but everyone you got right, he'd remove an article of clothing. <laughs> Hold on, Rob's got a reading series for us. I'm so excited. I just saw this pop, uh, pop across the Atlanta Voice. So I haven't read this. I'm reading this for the first time, but the, the headline got me. And I just think maybe this might spark some conversation. So the headline of this story is Stacey Abrams to executive produce CBS drama. Oh. <laughs> God damn it, Stacey. Oh my God. Fucking hell. Uh, I know where this is going. I'm not going to dance for you. I am willing to admit that. I think you will dance for me. Here we go. Feel free to interrupt at any moment. Jesus Christ. Political powerhouse Stacey Abrams is stepping into the entertainment industry. According to The Hollywood Reporter, uh, Abrams has inked a deal with CBS to executive produce a show based on a novel she wrote. Abrams is getting into television. The former Georgia lawmaker and voting rights advocate will executive produce a drama and development at CBS. The book, titled Never Tell, was released under Abrams' That's alias, a horrible name. Selena Montgomery. That's a horrible, horrible name. I... Well, okay. You, what do you know about writing? Nothing. What does Abrams know about writing? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Probably something. She wrote a book called Never Tell. Only it wasn't her. It was her alias, Selena Montgomery. The novel, which made its debut 15 years ago, follows the and that just shows you never give up, guys. Never give up. <laughs> the novel, which made its debut 15 years ago, follows the journey of criminal psychologist Dr. Aaron Abbott. Stop it. While in stop. Come on, she wrote a shitty crime book? That, oh, Jesus Christ. While investigating the whereabouts of a serial killer in New Orleans, she crosses paths with a local journalist, and they end up forming a relationship. i just like to point out here, everyone hates that, right? If you talk to journalists, the number one most like pernicious meme uh, for them is the idea in every movie you see it where it's like, oh, I'm doing a story on you, but... It's hard to do that without fucking you. So here we are. I just fall in love with every interview subject. Like, that's not a thing that happens. That's extremely unprofessional. That's, like, extremely, like, me too to the max. Do not do that. Uh, but I guess that is the primary, that is the animating factor of this particular novel. But um, I'll continue. Talisha Rags will serve as the writer for the project. Abrams will exec produce the project alongside Who Gives a Shit. Abrams, who served in the Georgia House of Representatives and as minority leader, is very passionate about writing. She's penned eight novels. The last book that she released under the Selena Montgomery moniker was titled Deception, which is centered around a woman who has to return to her hometown following a murder mystery. Although she likes to keep her political and literary work separate, Abrams says that both worlds are undeniably intertwined. Uh. Quote, Leadership requires the ability to engage and to create empathy for communities with disparate needs and ideas, telling an effective story, especially in romantic suspense. It demands a similar skill set, she told the Washington Post. When I began writing novels, I read Aristotle to learn how to perfect structure. <laughs> yes. I read Pearl Klieg to sustain tension. And of course, Nora Roberts for characterization. Of course. Of Good course. romantic suspense. 
Good romantic suspense can never underestimate the audience, and the best political leaders know how to shape a compelling narrative that respects voters and paints a picture of what is to come. Yeah, see, the overlap is that she's entirely full of shit in both disciplines. Good for Stacey her. Abrams is the most disappointing Georgia politician. So, you know, that appeared in The Hollywood Reporter. Very exciting to see Stacey Abrams being given another opportunity. I didn't know that she was a writer, you know, as someone with a master of the fine arts. Like, I can appreciate that sort of endeavor. <laughs> and I think all of us, really, I mean, it seems superfluous because we already appreciate Stacey Abrams so much. And if anyone has anything counter to that, I'll go ahead and yield the floor yeah. to them. <laughs> I just want to jump in um, here and set this before we go. That Stacey Abrams has fucked up so fucking hard, and she has basically been replaced in Georgia by a bunch of very shitty politicians, neither of which are going to win a fucking Senate seat uh, in November. There's two of them up for election in Georgia, and the Democrats are going to completely shit the bed on that. It's it's sad. I'm sad. I have sad. Yeah, it sucks that instead of getting Stacey Abrams, we're going to have shitty politicians, right, Brett? It's this is incredible. I feel so good about calling her a mercenary now. Well, see, here's the I feel, thing. I feel People, pretty fucking justified. Nobody heard you say it, so you might as well be making this up. When did you call her a mercenary and why? <laughs> like, it's it's nice to take credit for something that there's no evidence of. That's like when that's like when I called Fancy having the best choreo and winning the Mama 2019. I did it on the record. So, Brett, I'm gonna need some convincing if you really. Uh, called this Stacey Abrams mercenary shit. So for the audience, what's happening here is Brad and I have occasionally argued about Stacey Abrams because while I supported her running for Senate and beating, was it Brian Kemp? Uh, Brian, no, that was, was Brian Kemp was governor. Oh, she was running for governor, yes. So uh, while I totally supported that candidacy because obviously fucking anybody's better than Brian Kemp, I was not convinced that she was amazing, particularly after the whole uh, covering for Joe Biden being a racist shit that she pulled like five, six months ago now. What does that mean? I don't pay attention to politics. How did she do that? Uh, when all the busing stuff was coming out and a lot of negative stories about Joe Biden basically, you know, voting the worst way possible right. for his entire career when it came to African-American rights and literally anything dealing with minority groups, she came out and went, no, he's not He's not a racist. He's a good man. And he's just, and just did the whole thing where she was like, let me provide cover for him. And that's why everybody thought she was angling to be VP. Right. And, and there, like, were, and there were a ton of, and there were also a ton of stories that came out at this time that Stacey Abrams is not trying to be Joe Biden's VP, which I mean, obviously is, you know, she was trying to be his VP. And this was at. Yeah. But, but I just want to interrupt quickly, Brad. All this stuff worked on you, right? Because you were Stacey Abrams fan number one. Cool. <laughs> cool. So, uh, First of all, oh, I mean, I, I know you were because I heard you spend literally 45 minutes of your one mortal life arguing with Brett over why <laughs> Stacey Abrams is a net good and not a mercenary. So within the context of Georgia, I will still say Stacey Abrams is a net good. Within the context of Georgia is a great disclaimer. I mean, it's you can put that on a lot of horrible yeah, shit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it is what it is. And for the listener, I'm I'm a good boyfriend in the context of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> the debate we had were was are people like this was after Elijah Cummings died? Right, 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 right. Are people like Elijah Cummings and Stacey Abrams who seem like they're positive but never really stick their neck out for anything truly progressive or go to bat for things that are that might put them in a situation in which they'll lose? Right, these people who like position themselves in such a way that you you think oh they're great politicians, but then you can't actually point to any great things they led on. Sure. Right? How valuable are they actually? And that was the debate. I think uh, I think it started me saying that Stacey Abrams was angling for a VP spot because she realized that the Georgia GOP would never let her win a statewide election, which uh, mm -hmm. I think is I think is still true. Obviously, which is why Georgia is going to lose fucking both center spots. To uh, Democrats are neither going to get neither of them. You were excited for the possibility of her as a Bernie VP. And I was saying absolutely no, fucking I was not. No, 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 no. I was not a, a no, not for a Bernie VP. I've never been for her for Bernie VP. I, mm, are you sure? I do not remember you were saying, saying as an option that wasn't a bad one for for trying to win the South. He wants to do woman of color, but I've also said the entire time that the person who's going to be Bernie's VP, it, if you're really trying to win a state, is going to be. And I know everyone fucking hates this, and I fucking it's going to be fucking Beto because he has Texas. No, it's not. He's not gonna have Beto be his fucking VP. I, That's a terrible it's idea. It's not a great idea, but like who else is it? Who who literally anybody but the white dude who fails constantly. 
anybody who's like actually done progressive stuff, I will take anyone who's done one genuine progressive thing over him. Okay, and and like <laughs> we we did mercenary. we did like the whole like write up on Bre- Beto, and I think he fucking sucks. Like, don't get me wrong, but like. Beto also has the best network of anybody in the Democratic Party in the state of Texas. He has the best voter outreach. He has everything is there. And uh, he ran in 2018 running as Ted Cruz. And he I think he lost by like six or seven points. I, I can't remember what that is off the top of my head. But they took Dallas. They took uh, – Democrats took Dallas. Democrats took Houston. Like that's important. That's big. Right. And Texas is purple heading into 2020, like legitimately purple, which is insanity. Because if you take Texas – Nothing else matters. The GOP is dead, like as a national party, and you know, and yeah, I, yeah, I, he's not going to pass a lot of. You know what still matters is actually passing legislation. I don't, I don't doing, actually, which you can't. I do actually don't if think you don't win the presidency. I, but I, yeah, and I actually don't think passing legislation is going to matter anymore because I think we're kind of past that. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, but, I don't, I don't, uh, whole that, thing, that actually, yeah, he, he's got you it. there. Like a big part of Bernie Sanders' platform uh, and the way he differentiates himself from y- your your favored second son, Elizabeth Warren, is that mm. he says we aren't going to be able to get anything done because you look at the Supreme Court, you look at the legislation that's coming out of Congress. There's no fucking way to crack that nut without going outside of the traditional levers of power. I don't, you guys, you guys got to learn from this shit. Like Obama did the same thing with Hillary. You don't keep shitty politicians career alive because you're doing some cynical fucking opportunist shit to try to steal votes. Pick Lloyd Doggett. He's from Texas. And he's at least a little progressive. Lloyd Doggett is a man, uh, or rather he was born a man, but he's living as a pimp. So Lloyd Doggett would be a great selection, but it's another white but man. Also, yeah, and he doesn't have the dude. ground game that Beto has. Care. Look, I don't care. Bernie doesn't need it. Bernie does not need Beto to win. If Bernie wins the nomination, he will win the election. I will dox whatever I, the fuck I, you I, need I me to I completely agree on that, on that one, but I also would like to, like... St- Tox, not dox. Tox, whatever. Talks I would blocks, also like to... Uh, Google it. Yeah, it's... Yeah, <laughs> R.I.P. Vile Rat. Um, I would also like to see, like, the boot on... <laughs> yeah, that is true. That was a tox clause. He was like... It, his talks clause was like, if the Libyans get over this wall, I'll eat my hat and die. And, <laughs> no, fuck, it was as good as his word. What a bro. Uh, now his mom is uh, being charted on stage oh, at the RNC. He didn't want to get banned, I'm just saying. <clears throat> Sorry, con- continue. I don't remember what I was saying, fuck. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. If Bernie wins, if Bernie gets the nomination, he's going to win because he'll just, ins- unless he has a heart attack on stage. But I mean, like, Trump could also die literally any minute. Uh, he probably had a small That's stroke really. the other day. Um, so, 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 Brad, you're willing to concede that actually you don't need Texas for Bernie to win and Beto's not a good pick. But I don't think he's saying you need Beto to win. I think he's saying you need Beto to murder the GOP. I, I right? think that if you. That's what winning yeah, is. Yeah, I think, I think if you can win, like on top of. Obviously, we're all voting for the same person here, let's be real. But I think if you can do it and then, like, put your boot on the throat of Texas at the same time. And the Texas GOP is completely fucking imploding right now. Like, if you're going to do it, now is the time to do it. Uh, so it's a matter of, of what's the best pick in terms of like, you know, Brett, you're a consultant in terms of like expected value. Like if he's going to win either way, but as Brad says, we can put the boot on the throat of the Texas GOP, something that in the electoral college is extremely important has been a bulwark for them for so long. Why would you not do that? Let Bernie get not- in, let Bernie pass the, the, all of the bills that he wants to pass or that he can pass. Let him go out there, stand on the picket lines while he's doing one thing, Beto's doing another, AOC's doing another. It's a big tent, but we're all pushing in the same direction because Beto can't split from his own president. And we know that he's willing to do whatever he has to do for the media coverage. That seems like not, no, a, not a bad absolutely idea. Not. No, no, because what you're saying, you're doing the, the normal fucking DNC thing of saying, what we've got to do is appeal to these moderates and these centrists. And that's bullshit. But it's a meaningless Bernie, position. No, Bernie's appeal is that he is consistent and authentic. If he suddenly picks up a mercenary, he's saying, that's not what I actually am. What I'm about is tactics. And again, I fucking... I disagree with the point that that magically wins you stuff. That's not true. We're just making the assumption that based off of this thing, if you combine it with this thing, he'll win. Maybe he wins Texas because he's the first authentic politician to talk to regular people in Texas. And we have a ground game through Beto's group that allows people to actually look into Bernie because they're door knocking rather than getting Fox News and Daily Caller updates on Facebook. And and let me jump in. It's such a blinkered view to only do that. Brad, let me jump in. 
uh, and that like it, you didn't say anything negative or wrong about Bernie. Like I just I agree with every single thing you said. But in this country, we are unfortunately faced with like the cruel reality. The GOP is not something to be like beat at the ballot box. Like it's really something to be defeated. Like the GOP needs to be destroyed, like salt of the earth, that sort of thing. And one of the th- Sherman style, yeah, baby. that's right. Yeah, I don't disagree yeah, with that. It, I also don't think this does that. I, yeah, if you, okay, we're talking about this hypothetical where, like, you know, Bernie taking, uh, you know, making Beto his VP, and it helps him win Texas fifty-one to forty-nine. Yeah, how do we burn their strongholds down if we we name someone that no one's ever heard of? That's far left to be in the ceremonial VP position. How does that actually get into their bastion? Right, Florida, Florida, and I apologize to both of you. you Florida is a lost cause. Like Florida is, it's Florida is Florida. Yeah, no, of Hard to agree. Yeah, yeah. Florida's yeah no. Look, I, I knew that when I was four years old. <laughs> but, There's a reason neither of us are like pick a Florida left. But like, but like, like Ohio is going to be difficult. Like Wisconsin, these, these states are going to be difficult. And this is just, and I, I know you said this is tactics, and it absolutely is. I actually is. don't think those will be hard for Bernie. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I, I think you might be right. They'll be harder given that the status quo is Nancy Pelosi, right. anti-labor policies. But like, you know what? You take Texas or you take Georgia, like we all go to bed at 830 on, you know, that Tuesday. And, and obviously we don't go to bed. We go to like, you know, Pizza Hut and get... <laughs> get fat or whatever well that's a lot of carbs so probably not but there's <laughs> oh yes this is there's other all I, I get what you're yeah. saying like you take georgia it does us no good if the revolution happens but we're still fat yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean? <laughs> anyway subscribe to red scare <laughs> you take georgia you take georgia just once you put like you take two senators and then you get they get six years or you take texas once like that's it that's that's your game for against the gop uh all of a sudden for the next two years the media narrative is all about you Right. It's like, what is it about this that was able to flip Texas? And it's going to be they're going to talk about this podcast, how we had this conversation uh, in 2019, <laughs> December 7th. I'm write it down. Um, you know, that's just. But all of these are things he's going to get anyway. If Bernie wins, it's already historic. It's going to be the first. It's easily the most progressive person to ever win president. Probably the only leftist that might ever win, knowing the way the fucking FBI you, works. You think with, with all the gerrymandering, with all the voter suppression, with the way the Electoral College is set up, you think it's a guarantee that Bernie's going to win Texas if he gets out of the primary and Ohio I don't and think Wisconsin. it's a guarantee he'll win Texas. I think it's a guarantee he'll win. I guarantee he'll win wisconsin ohio if he gets to the general do you think that was brad said actually be like a boot on the throat of the gop if he wins but he doesn't win if he wins but he doesn't win on the throat if he wins but he doesn't crush texas does that just allow the villain to come back later stronger the villain's going to come back no matter what you do guys there's well, no well, Brad is there's, saying no that no, it's not the case. There is literally nothing he's going to do in this election that will vanquish the fascists. No, that's not going to happen. I like that is way too hopeful, guys. No, but it, but yeah, we're going to be fighting them for I, a I long time. I agree, and I'm you know whatever. But like you put two senators in this uh, from Georgia into the Senate. Yeah, that's that, valuable. That fucks over the GOP for six years. That fucks up what all the math. What if two senators who are like the dude in Alabama who just won? Doug Jones. How valuable is that really? Here is the broader point, which, like Brad pointed out, Doug Jones did get in line, and that was under, you know, a, a Trump presidency with his constituency. What it is, if you flip Texas, it feels a lot safer to go ahead and push left because you don't have no. the Joe Mansions of the world dictating uh, the status quo, right? Am I not? No, not you're, to, you're I, honestly, you are incorrect because nothing about the Dems has ever proven out that they will move left if they feel like they have a safe seat. If anything, they consistently argue you should never do leftist politics, even in safe seats. That is their constant argument. Let me let me put this a different way. Not a single person who's been in traditional in the traditional DNC, right, for the last few decades. Anybody who has been willing to play ball with them should be someone that we ever promote in any situation. Uh, with with the possibility, or if we think that Bernie's going to win regardless, because they are snakes that can't be trusted. The ideal is you get rid of them and replace them with politicians who aren't beholden to a Bill Clinton 90s version of politics in America, right? People who actually care about labor issues, right? And actually care about the people. That is the ideal. So anything that's going to promote them in a situation in which you absolutely do not have to work with them, like if he's running on his own as a senator in Texas, yeah, I'll support him because he's better than Cornyn, of course, right? That is different than going, you have the sea of literally whatever human you want, Bernie, that is above these three very vague requirements. Who's it going to be? Yeah, no, let's let's do the work of turning the party into something that's not useless. That is that is my point. 
So under no circumstances do I want to help the party as it currently exists or anybody who's been working with them. We're talking about a world, obviously, with Bernie, where we are worried about his VP. Not just because he's not going to, he, he's an older guy, we're worried about, you know, who's going to take over after one term possibly, but because we have this sort of thought of him passing this baton on, and we want to make sure that that person who the baton is passed to is, you know, pr sufficiently and, you know, progressive in what we all like and things like that, et cetera, et cetera. And it's entirely, entirely valid that we don't like uh, Beto as that person. And I'm not saying that we do. I'm not uh, standing for Beto because he fucking goes to like Whataburger or some shit and rides a skateboard. You're talking about Bernie has never done anything that should be, you know, is expected to be done of him or whatever, that he's always done his own thing. And, and we're worried about like pushback from the, you know, establishment DNC as opposed as on top of the, the Republicans. What in the world is stopping him from nominating AOC in 2024? Because Bernie is this wild card that we keep talking about that he's just, he does everything his own way. Like, I will totally argue that Bernie sees an opportunity that he knows he's going to win in 2020, that he can fuck over Georgia or Texas. And then in 2024, he can be like, you know what? Thank you for what you did for me, Beto or whomever. But AOC is who we're all voting for in 2024, who the entire left has been waiting for for the last six years. And I'm going to endorse them for president moving forward. Thank you for your service. I hope you win that house seat and, you know, wherever the fuck ever you're going to go. Like, I think that's that's a completely acceptable um you know, a, a completely acceptable scenario for me moving forward because you get the best of basically all worlds. That sounds pretty you dope. You fuck over Texas, you screw the GOP there, or you fuck over Georgia, you get four years of Bernie, then Bernie goes to like a maple syrup farm in Vermont while he says, AOC, go in there and fuck him up, fam. I'm out. Fuck all of you. Bye. Like, that sounds... Yeah, no true leftist, no true leftist really has the ground game right now, so why not play the mercenaries for what they're worth and then pass it to the, the real ideologues once you've had four years of controlling the narrative, killing the GOP and promoting these people in your cabinet, perhaps. Yeah, I just disagree. I don't think it's going to kill the GOP and I don't, but I'm not, I, again, it's not a utility thing. I like, I just, I disagree with the way you guys are framing it. Like, so it's a framing the, the point issue. of Paul, the point of the way burning does politics is that it's not about utility. It's about messaging, having the morally correct position and ideology and caring about the regular people. The VP pick should reinforce those things, right? Yeah, it should reinforce the mercenaries his messaging. mercenaries will turn over to that and do that. If all you care about is the messaging and narrative, you can get people no. to do the messaging and narrative that have the ground game. It doesn't reinforce the message if you pick a mercenary. That's my point. Yeah, but most people don't pay attention to politics until it gets into the thick of things. The vast majority of people who are going to come around to a future socialist world are going to need to be swayed at some point. And if they can be swayed by someone who sends thousands of door knockers and says the exact same things that somebody right now in 2019 and in 2020, maybe they don't have it in their heart, but they're willing to change for the nature of power <laughs> right now. Maybe that's as good as we can get right now. It's not. And that gets us there. No, we can do better than that. And also, Bernie's most effective messaging with a lot of people who are non-voters, which is who he's trying to get to vote, right? Like, that's sort of the point, is he's trying to get people who have been pushed out by regular politics because they don't speak to them. The most effective messaging he has is the fact that he's clearly not part of the normal political establishment and that he's authentic. People know who Beto is. It's clearly not authentic if Beto suddenly says different shit, right? Like it's it, it it undercuts his entire fucking appeal for a good chunk of people that he appeals to. These people who never get appealed to otherwise. I like it, to me. It, there's it's not a utility thing. Like they have to be in line with the ideology and messaging. Like I don't think they need to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but they need to be like clearly an authentic progressive. That's I, I, I want to just point out again that I've been saying from the very beginning about Beto that he was just running for vice president. That's always been my play on him, like running for this presidential thing. And I can't tell anymore. He's such a fucking. Idiot. Has, he hasn't. I haven't heard I thought, a single I thought he was thing. Going to try to do the president. I haven't heard a single thing from him since he dropped out. I know. I, I genuinely thought like he was going to make a play for president and then he was going to read the tea leaves. And if it didn't look good, then he bail into Senate seat. But he's he fucking read the press clippings or something. It's almost like he's not saying anything so he can recalibrate to the political beliefs of whoever it is selects him as Veep. Ugh. I mean, I'm sure that he's trying to see who's going to fucking pull through here in the next in the first month or two of the fucking primary when they, the votes start coming in. He we'll counters everyone so well. He's a 
He's actually not even young as Obama was when he ran, but it's fine. People don't realize that. He's a youngish white dude. Wow. From the South, and Bernie's got him standing next to AOC. They're playing fucking Jay-Z up on the stage, and they're da- hitting the dab, and everybody loves it. And he's saying, Medicare for all. This is the saddest fanfic. No, I, look, you want a sad fanfic. I've got a... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This is Brad at Relentless Board. We had Rob at Dumb and Awful and Brad at Fish the Shizzle. Uh, feel free to hop in the Discord and come chat with us. Also, we have Patreon. You can get the back episodes. We have a few bonus episodes as well. If you want to support us in another way, write a review on iTunes. It's incredibly useful because everything is run by algorithms and bots and life is hell. Anyway, thanks for listening, y'all. Have a good one.